Are you ready for rapid fire? Ready for the Wednesday edition, baby. Let's go. Okay. I do have some uh, questions, a, a, a few stragglers that I'm saving up that I think will pair up with some of the stuff that we're going to talk nice. about in rapid fire tonight. Fill in the blank. Number one thing that stood out to you watching the first five periods of Notre Dame football practice this morning, excuse me, was blank. Ooh. Well, I mean, this is going to bleed into the next question, but the number one thing that stood out to me was the fact that Riley Leonard was anywhere near a football uh, and throwing it at a practice. Like that's the, that's the number one thing that stood out to me uh, outside of that. I just really love the way Marcus Freeman sets that's up the next practice. topic. So he's I know saving that's, that. That, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. So I'm like, yeah. uh, but I, I really like the way Marcus Freeman sets up his practices. You know, they go through stretch, he brings them together, fires them up a little bit, and then they go into a hitting drill. You know what I mean? He is all about competition and just starting out practice on a high note, and they're just banging each other and banging each other, and he's right there with the whistle, you know, controlling this entire um, drill that they're doing. I mean, he's part of it, and then then they get off, and then they start doing their individual stuff, or they did special teams or whatever. But I just love the way he kind of starts things off and the way he puts practices together. That, that that continues to stand out to me when I watch practice. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, again, it was a five-period practice, and we didn't get to see a whole lot in terms of competitive-type stuff. There was <coughs> some. So what I went with, because what you already mentioned is what we're going to talk about next, and we'll just right. you know get more into detail about Riley Leonard here in a minute. But another quarterback was there today. This is visit week, and there were a lot of recruits on hand today. And when I was walking up to the Irish Athletic Center, there were all these golf carts out there today. And I'm like, man, what's with all the golf carts? Said, oh, yeah, that's right. We just did a whole show about this, Ryan Roberts, and I, yesterday about all the visits that are going on. And Brady Hart was uh, hanging out with Chad Bowden on the field for most of the time that we were there for, what, the 30 minutes or so that we were there. The 2026 quarterback from Florida was uh, was out there today six foot four 180 pounds he looked a little thicker than 180 I thought but just the fact that he was out there hanging with Chad Bowden you know like they had their eyes on what the quarterbacks were doing and stuff like that obviously quite a bit but this is a guy like as a sophomore Vince 14 and 1 41 touchdowns <laughs> led his team to a state championship in Florida now a smaller school but still in Florida yeah his dad was a former major league baseball player. His dad, Alex, played both in college at the University of Florida, drafted by the Pirates. So this is a guy that Notre Dame's after. And Look, he was hanging out there with Chad Bowden most of the, the last, time we were out there today. The last time I saw a quarterback hanging out exclusively with Chad Bowden was? Do you remember? Deuce. Deuce. Yep. And he was there exclusively Probably with Bowden last spring. and Gadouli. And it just feels... Felt very similar, at least from my vantage point. It felt very similar. They were talking to each other. They were kind of pointing some stuff out, and they were, do, you know, they they, they were uh, they were hitting it pretty hard. I yep, say that. So yes, he looked interested. Yeah, TD four ND wants to know if he looked interested. He did not look disinterested. He didn't look like a sophomore in high school either. I can tell no, you. He that. Didn't. <laughs> no, he didn't. I mean, at six foot four, anyone's going to look older than a sophomore in high school. To He's put together. Us. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he, he was. He was put together, that's for sure. Like I said, the listed weight that I saw was 180. He looked, you know, he didn't look like he was 220 by any means, but he looked a little, he right. looked like he had, a, you know, a few milkshakes uh, above 180 anyway. Fill in the blank, Vince. Riley Leonard going through light practice while wearing an ankle brace at practice today is blank. Shocking. I was not anticipating that in any way, shape, or form. And my initial reaction was, what the hell are they thinking? Um, I I tried to... Put it to, bluntly. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being honest. Like, that was my first reaction. Like, why? Why? What is the point? What are you gaining from having him out there and doing this kind of stuff? And look, at the end of the day, <clears throat> it was obviously all non-contact stuff. It was, there was nobody around him, anywhere near him, as he was throwing the football, which is obviously important. You don't want him taking team reps, even though he's got the red jersey on. You just never know if he's going to get stepped on or pushed or whatever. Like, you don't want that to happen. But I was trying to play devil's advocate with myself, and I was thinking, okay, 
Most people's complaints about him being injured again in the spring is that he's going to lose timing with his receivers and all this other stuff. If he's able, which he appeared to be, because I think he had his best throwing day that we've seen in a long time. If he's able to be out there throwing on air to his receivers without any possibility of a setback, then okay, you can have him out there. I still, Vince D'Addario thinks that, that I would have him in a rocker on the sideline away from anything. It is his right foot, his plant foot. Correct. Um, it, it it just looked to me like he really had to fight himself a couple of times. Like, like the other three quarterbacks would start jogging downfield, and he wanted to, and then he kind of caught himself and had to yeah, stop himself. Yeah, he can't himself. jog. Yeah, he, that's he, right. He, what happens if he trips over himself? Yeah. For, for what? A, th- a few passes? You know, like the, the whole timing right. thing? Again, you rest for two months and you've got the entire summer. The quarterbacks and receivers are together exactly. all the time in the summer if you want to work on timing. Like, this is not a worry spot this spring. I, I, I like you, was completely shocked that he was out there <laughs> and the fact that, you know, he was walking with the limp, which you would expect. But, you know, again, you're in this situation – Because you had a lingering injury that you had surgery on, and now you've developed a stress fracture in your foot. You had to have a plate replaced in your foot. And just a couple weeks removed from that, you're out there with a brace on your ankle, throwing the football. Like, there just just seems to be no purpose to it for me. Like you said a couple of weeks ago when this injury first popped up, put him in bubble wrap and (laughs) don't let him anywhere near the field. In the spring, I, I I see no real reason that he needed to be out there doing anything. You know, again, it wasn't live, but just sure. the fact that he's out there and anything anything stupid can happen. I just right. I, yeah. I don't find any reason that he needs to be out there right now. Yep, completely agree. I just I think the cons outweigh the pros yes. on this one. I really do. I tried to wrap my mind around it, and I tried to be you know positive about it, but like. Your season is hinging on this guy. Let's be honest. They can still be a 10-win team and, uh, you know, eh, but I I just, your, your national championship hopes are resting right in that ankle. So I would not have him anywhere near action. Yeah. TD4ND, if he missed next year from injury, could he play college in 2025? He could. Yeah, he could. It would be another year older and at that point going back to the question that came up during the mailbag portion of the show he would have an injury prone label at that yes point. and he would also be if he misses this entire season he would also transfer out of notre dame too i think i don't think you they think would so? wait around for him because hold back <clears> everybody he, else's development yeah for a year exactly they, they've got kind of a plan you know what i mean Who, whoever that plan is for 25 it would be fast forwarded to 24 And I just don't think that they would wait around for Riley Leonard. I just don't. Again, this is just my first initial thinking of it. No, I think Uh, that makes sense because if he, if he were to miss the entire season, someone else is starting those games, at least one, someone else, if not two, someone else's. Exactly. So exactly. Yeah. I I think at that point, you know, someone's going to prove themselves or disprove themselves. And then. Yeah, I, I think the ship has probably sailed at that point. It's a good point. You probably and, don't. And Joe, Joe says he'll be as old as the walk-on kicker. He's a true <laughs> senior right now. Like, he's he's not old. He's like 21. So, or he's going to be a true senior. He's not even, right. a, he's a true junior. He's still a true junior right now. Right. Yeah. So, he's, not, he's three years removed, not even three full years removed from high school yet. So, he's not an old man. It's not Sam Hartman with a sixth year of eligibility. Like that's not what we're talking about here. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. <clears throat> so Vince, the Chicago bears, of course, have the mm. both, both the number one and number nine overall draft picks in the draft later this month. Most of the talk of course, has been about what they're doing at number one, Caleb Williams, all that kind uh. of stuff. But their general manager, Ryan Poles has come up with a plan to determine what they'll do with the number nine pick. He says his staff is going to break into teams and each team will plead its case for drafting a certain position. So in other words, you'll have one team that's arguing for the tech, you know, like, oh, we need to draft a tackle here. And then another team is going to argue for the receivers. Another argue 
for defensive ends. You're going to have all these kind of clashing clans, you know, with their uh, position groups going head to head on who you're going to draft at number nine. What do you think of this idea? It sounds like a middle school group project is what it sounds like to <laughs> it me. It kind of does. It sounds ridiculous. You're in I'm, charge of magic markers. You're yeah, in like, charge of paint. You get so, the sparkles. You bring God, the glue. <laughs> I, I get that you want to flesh out different ideas. I get it. I totally get it. But I feel like he's like, okay, you guys do all these different things and then just come back to me with a presentation. And then I'll make the final decision. Mm-hmm. I just, I don't like it. It seems very juvenile. It seems like he doesn't want to do the work himself. Um, all of those things is what it feels like to me. And I feel like he's going to be sitting back with like a rubric, like grading out, you know, as they're given the presentation. Oh, okay. Uh, and the highest grade goes to, all right, that's what we're going to do. I, I don't like it. Yeah. And you know, like, what's the, you know, the thing about you know, like too many cooks in the kitchen or whatever it's, you know, like I used to have a boss that told me, you know, like, don't ask for input from other people because you're only going to get a million different answers when you do that, you know, yep. sit back and do the work yourself and make the decision yourself. You can weigh it out all you want, but you know, like how attached to these different position groups are these people really going to be, you know, like, right. are they going to get truly dug in on this whole thing? And then you're going to have like, you know, these, these big, you know, like fraction, you know, it's going to fracture because you, you know, like you go with the receiver you know, when the, you know, two thirds of the rest of the guys wanted you to go with, you know, two different other people, you know, are you going to end up, spl- you know, splintering the whole thing? So, Seriously. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think it's um, on the one hand there, there is at least a little bit of creativity to it, but on the other hand, it just feels like it's a little bit too much. And the guy at the top who's getting paid all the money just needs to take the input, you know, via the normal routes and, make a decision with his big boy pants on. Exactly. It just feels like he's feels like he's spreading the blame before the decision is made. That's yeah, that's like. true too. He's got someone he can point the finger at if it goes wrong. Right. Yeah. Mm. Decaf wants to know if there's any word on Matty Westbeld yet. There has not been that I have seen. Let me check the, uh, the old X file here. Ooh, real quickly. I like that. Just make X-file. sure. Maybe that's what he should have called it. Just X Files instead yeah, of Yeah. Love it. <laughs> she tweeted the other day on Monday, April Fool's Day can't be the right day to announce anything with a uh laughing emoji. She has not tweeted anything since then. So Maddie. still no word from Maddie Westbelt on what she's going to do with her future. All right. Fine. I'm trying to yeah. put myself in her shoes. I mean, she'd probably be a pretty high draft pick. But I, I don't know. That, like the WNBA know. is so tough. Is you know, it? Okay. like okay. Because even even first round picks in the WNBA don't always make a roster. Oh wow, you know? I didn't know that. So yeah, like okay. you have to be upper half. And I just I don't know. She's got, Fair I enough. think, 12 days from now to announce what her plans are. I think the draft is is coming up here fairly quickly. Let me let me check here real quick. It is April 15th. Yes. So it's, they've got to make their decision here. Yeah, I was going to say it's coming up because they got to at least give teams an opportunity to, you know, get them on their board and all of those different things. But yeah. Yeah. Josh asks, just a fun thought, since the college women's game is becoming so popular and we have so many alumni in the WNBA, what would you guys think about the WNBA having alumni teams? So like Notre Dame team versus the UConn team or whatever. Um, I mean, I think that would be kind of a cool like all star all star thing. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Put all you get enough players from different. Yeah. Like however many. You've got maybe even just do it three on three as opposed to like full teams. So you can do like a little. You'd have a lot of guards for Notre Dame. That would be. Yeah, the that's very true. That's very true. But, you, you know, like a little three on three alumni type tournament or something like that. Kind of like they're, you know, they did. They're doing three on three in the Olympics and stuff like that. I know? think that'd be fun. Do it as like an all star weekend kind of a thing. Yeah. You know, I'd be I would watch that. Honestly, I, I, I'll i say it. I would watch it. 
I would. I think that would be fun. I, there's a lot of Notre Dame. I mean, gosh, what is there? Five or six Notre Dame players in the WNBA right now, at least. Because I know, I think three or so made the all-star team last year. So, I mean, yeah, that would be a lot of fun. I would watch that. Mm-hmm. TD4ND says Westbelt would raise her stock by staying. And I I agree with that as well because she she worked a lot with the uh, new addition to the LIV staff, Carlos Knox, this year. He was his official title is player development. And he had spent the last several years actually in the WNBA, including okay. Indiana Fever. And I, I think her game, you know, a lot of it there there were some different aspects to it. But I, I think that um, she could really potentially like turn herself. She she would raise her stock. I just I agree with that. I think she could be potential has a chance to turn herself into a high first round draft pick next year, as opposed to probably yeah you know mid to lower this year. And again, just being a first round pick is not a guarantee that you're going to end up making a roster. I think a couple of years ago, like the Indiana Fever cut a player that they drafted wow. fairly high in the first round. So, Oof. yeah. Fill in the blank. The Iowa LSU Elite Eight women's game setting an all-time viewership record with more than 12.3 million viewers is blank. It was predicted right here on IB Nation Sports Talk because we talked about how it could have been the highest, re- you know, all of that, right? Because uh, I believe the... National championship game last year was what 10 point something. And this ended up getting Mm -hmm. 12 point something. That's awesome. That is, that is awesome. You know, people were watching for all the right reasons because it was great gameplay on both sides. Even though I know there's a faction of people, a large faction that wanted to see LSU lose for whatever reasons. I was one of those people for sure. Uh, But, you know, watching Caitlin Clark play was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed the game. I watched the game. The first half was extremely competitive. I thought the coaching was good on both sides. You know, they had to, I was amazed at how Iowa was able to just dominate the second half after the, as close as it was in the first half. Yes. Angel Reese ended up with like 20. I didn't even realize it at the time. She ended up with 20 rebounds in that game. She was all over the place. And for a minute there, she was the only one rebounding. It felt like that's true too. I mean, it was, yeah. So, and and, no, but I said it yesterday. It was, you know, it takes a lot for me to be locked in from start to finish in a game. And we've talked about my, you know, thumb on the clicker. You are click happy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I will flip. If you're not, if I'm not engaged, I will flip. And I don't think we flipped off the game all night, even during commercials. I flipped at halftime. Kept me engaged. I might have at halftime just like to see. Because I know there was some baseball on. I can't remember exactly. But here's some perspective, though. That game, 12.3 million viewers. Better than the World Series last year. Better than the NBA Finals last year. Better than better viewership than the Orange Bowl, Cotton Bowl, and Peach Bowl this past year. Wow. Better than the Big Ten, Pac-12, and Big 12 championship games. More viewership. That's And I'm talking football, not basketball. Right. And also, 12.3 million for that women's basketball game is better than every 2023 college football game with the exception of Ohio State, Michigan. Wow. Not bad. It's amazing what <laughs> Not happens. Not bad at all. Everybody hates one team. <laughs> it is. Well, and that's. And they want to see. You know, that Clark drives too, it. But, you, like yeah. I said last night, you had, you had <clears throat> perceived good versus it. Yeah. Evil. You had a hero and a villain. I mean, that's, oh, yeah. that's what drives drama and TV and, and ratings, right? You had somebody yep. to cheer for. You had somebody to cheer against. Absolutely. And there was multiple things to cheer against for LSU. And, you know, and then you had Iowa, who was obviously Caitlin Clark, but then they had a bunch of role players and they're just the all shucks. We're just here to win, you know, kind of an attitude, which was great. I mean, it was great. They then the supporting cast for Iowa played really well. And it's the first Iowa game I've watched. And I don't know if that's the norm or not, but I was very impressed. They played very well as a team. Yeah. Antoine's going the racial route. I'll just say like whoa, that had whoa, nothing to do with it. Whoa. For me, I'm just, I'm speaking. 
But the Kim Mulkey factor is the bigger thing. Oh, I can't That's, stand that woman. And she's yes. as white as they come. To me, it's it was really, you know, like um, Flo J. Johnson, like great player. Like that's who should have been trying to defend Caitlin Clark, I think, most of the night and not the little blonde girl. Right. <laughs> who's having trouble. Well, by the way, the I don't like her either. Row. And she's very no. white. So it has <laughs> exactly nothing to do. Right. Has nothing to do with race whatsoever. It has to do with attitude and uh, the way they come off when they talk. I mean, that's, you know, I didn't like her when she was at Louisville. And I don't like Kim Mulkey in any way, shape, or form. So, yeah. <laughs> Paul Mall smoker coach, says Joe. That's, I mean, kind of sums it up, I think. Salty said the LSU-Iowa Elite Eight game showed us some of the best of Clark and the worst of Reese. What do you expect from Clark and Beckers in the semifinal game and who wins? I'm really interested to see this because the page Beckers I saw when Notre Dame played at UConn and beat UConn underwhelming. back in January was yeah, very underwhelming. Yeah. Like, Nana Hidalgo completely outplayed her. And as I talked about with Muffet McGraw, I think that, like within the next day or two, when I had Muffet on the show after that, UConn game, Gino Ariema had no answers for Hannah Hidalgo that night. And I mean, that's obviously going to be the question. Can he at least put together half an answer for Caitlin Clark? That's going to be the whole thing. I, we're not going to see those two players, I don't think, go head-to-head, -head, one -on one-on-one a lot in that game. You're going to see whoever UConn thinks is its you know, best defender, yeah. best defender slash next best defender on Caitlin Clark. <clears throat> and you know, like you might say, you know, like be interesting to see what Iowa counters with um, with Paige Beckers, but not too many people have had answers for Caitlin Clark as as yeah, I, out the other night. If I'm coaching, I'm just throwing a multitude of players at her, you know, just different styles, different ways, just trying to mess with her as much as I can. You know, you throw a zone, you throw a man to man, you you gotta you gotta match up, you gotta. You can't just do one thing. You can't you can't just do one thing and just hope it works. You know what I mean? You you've got to you've got to continue to kind of throw different things at her and and hope that something right. sticks for a little while because then she's going to adjust and then you've got to adjust. It's like it's gonna be a chess match. Yeah, David says that's because Sonya did a great job defensively on Beckers, and you're absolutely right. And that's really, you know, like don't get me wrong. Hidalgo's obviously a great player, and the fact that she's leading the nation in steals shows that. But something that doesn't show up in stats is just being a true lockdown defender. Right. And that that is the underrated part of Citron because she does typically draw the other team's best offensive player. Obviously, especially, you know, if they're they're a guard or a wing or whatever, she's gonna draw the other team's best player defensively and she's had a lot more success than not oh and yeah that's, you know again that's 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 where she's so underrated i think is just what she does at the defensive end of the floor stuff just little stuff that doesn't necessarily show up on a stat sheet you know with the exception of holding that player below their average most of the time sure Two notable NCAA tournament snubs, Indiana State and Seton Hall, Vince, are in the NIT championship game after semifinal wins last night. Does making it to the NIT title game make up for missing out on March Madness? Does it mean they should have been in March Madness, or does it make it up for them? Like, how are you – you make going it up for way? them. Because, like, the whole okay. – like, I think, I think it's, it's, it's actually – I heard another – show and i mean everyone's entitled to to go with the questions that they want you know they ask does this prove that they should have been in well no you make it all the way to the nit finals i think that there's at least some evidence that you probably deserved to be there but you know there's there's but always the, same... the question of who are you knocking out if you're letting right them in but, uh, yeah i'm just talking about from okay okay from that team's perspective yeah. does it sort of make up for the okay we got left out of march madness but now we're playing for an NIT championship. Yeah, because you play with a chip on your shoulder. That's how you frame it as a coach. Like, hey, man, we got left out. Let's go win this thing and prove everybody wrong. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, I think it does, um, honestly. I <clears throat> the, the argument that people are using, oh, they should have been in the NCAA tournament. Look what they're doing in the NIT. Well, if I'm not mistaken, they were the next best team right. that didn't make it in. 
Well, now they're in the next best tournament. They should win it. That That's my logic. They should win the next best tournament that you're in <laughs> sure. because they were the next best team to get left out. So I, this is expected as far as I'm concerned. If they would have gone and laid an egg in the NIT, then it would have just added fuel to the fire that they didn't belong. Right. And so they're just saying, hey, we're the next best. That You're saying that we're the next best. We're going to go win the next best tournament. And I, I think I, that's fine. I think Seton Hall like played an overtime game in their first round NIT game. And I think <laughs> that's that's where it's tough is those that that first round or two when you're playing right. in, sure. you know, in, in home gyms and <clears throat> the enthusiasm is typically fairly underwhelming. Right. I think I think that at least for like Indiana State, especially because there was so much talk about them and, you know, the cream Abdul Jabbar guy and, you know, that whole thing like this at least gives them some kind of national spotlight now sure. at the end of this thing. Maybe they would have won a game or two. They might have been stuck in a play in game. Who knows what would have happened had they actually made it to the NCAA tournament. But like getting through those first couple rounds is the most difficult part, I think, about the NIT because you have to sort of fake some enthusiasm yeah, for sure. to get through it. But now you're, you know, you're in the semifinals last night. Now you're in the championship game. You got a little bit more juice, and you know, you got a chance to hang a banner in your yeah. gym when it's all said and done. And I guess you could still have hung a banner if you had made it to the NCAA tournament. You know, you just, you know, especially like Indiana State, it's like, you know, because they haven't been to the tournament very often they could have hung something up there that said you know 2024 ncaa tournament or whatever but now they can hang something that either says champion. nit champion or nit runner-up when yeah it's all said and done absolutely i i did they get screwed no i don't think they got screwed i don't they didn't have the, they didn't have the resume for it yeah and i would they rather needed, go they need a little bit better wins along the way yeah they won the games they could but they needed a couple right. more like actual quality wins to get them in 100 percent I, I don't have any sympathy for Indiana State. I'm sorry. And it, it is the consolation right is the goal to just make it into the NCAA tournament and then get and then lose a you know, win a game and then lose in the round of thirty two. Right. Like is that the goal? Right. Or do you want right. to go to a tournament and potentially win the whole thing? I, yeah. I don't know. I, well, because like everyone says, oh, we missed out by not being able to see, you know, Cream Abdul, you know, like that guy. Turn on the NIT and you well, can it's watch like, look, it. They also could have lost in their first game and then no one was gonna talk about exactly. them anyway. The right. only time you start talking about them is if you do, you know, like what Oakland did and the Gelke right. guy or whatever that, you know, like you actually knock somebody yes. off and you move along. Exactly. By the way, I forgot to mention, I just saw this today. Um, you remember we were talking about when Marquette was here, the women for the NCAA tournament a couple of weeks ago, Megan Duffy, the former Notre Dame point guard was the Marquette head coach. She is no longer the Marquette head oh. coach. She will now be coaching against Notre Dame on the regular because she's the head coach at Virginia Tech. It was just announced today. Really? Yes. Wow. Virginia Tech head coach Kenny Brooks <clears throat> left and uh, is now the head coach at Kentucky. And so Megan Duffy, okay. former Irish point guard, is now the head coach at Virginia wow. Tech. So, wow. Okay. Going to Interesting Blast little development there. It is a very interesting development. So we're going to yeah. see a little bit more of her. Yeah. Awesome. Love it. Yep. Yeah. So now maybe Bill Scholl up there at Marquette goes fishing for another Notre Dame alum somewhere down the road. Wouldn't you know, surprise so. me. Nope. All right. How does UConn and North Carolina State both getting their men's and women's teams into the final four affect your interest in uh, this weekend's games? Does not affect it in any way, shape, or form. It's a zero. <laughs> for me i i will say it's an impressive feat especially uconn because they kind of have been doing it like it's kind of a continuous thing for them nc state it's a little bit you know more of an aberration especially since they were an 11 seed uh on the men's side fun story don't get me wrong but it does not make me want to watch the game anymore games plural any more than i would have in the first place yeah i agree uh, you know like especially like i I might be a little bit more inclined to watch the Purdue game because NC State is playing, you know, just based on who maybe the matchup would have been. Sure. Like, I don't know how interested I would have been. I, I probably still would have watched, but my clicker might have been out in full. <laughs> like, if Duke had won that game and it was Purdue-Duke, it'd kind of be, eh. Yeah. You know, on the men's side, UConn-Alabama, I'm not that thrilled about that. 
Um, you know, on the women's side, I would have watched the Iowa game no matter who Iowa was playing. So I suppose just the fact that it's UConn at least adds some more interest because you do have sure. you know yeah. a big program like that. NC State, South Carolina does nothing for me. <laughs> on NC the other State's going to get El Smoke showed by South yeah. Carolina, but yeah. you know, I do think you know something <clears throat> that's interesting is the Notre Dame women beat both of those teams, NC State and UConn, and here they are now in the Final Four, and they actually played South Carolina as well. So Notre Dame actually played three of the four teams that are in the Final Four this there year. There you go. Interesting little connection. Yeah. No How much doubt. that matters, I don't know, but it does show that they played some tough competition, I guess, at least this year. But, but big picture, yeah. I'm like you. It really doesn't affect me one way or the other. It's good for them. Hey, awesome. Yeah. You know, it's not an easy feat. But, uh, yeah, it doesn't make me want to watch anymore. Yeah. TD4 and D, cool, but doesn't move the needle. I think that I would yeah, probably. I think that's fair. I mean, it's great for those schools, obviously. <clears throat> and when you like, when you look, it, it kind of stinks, actually, that you have Purdue, who hasn't been there since 1980, and NC State, who hasn't been there since 83, playing against each other. You and know? and the, the matchup of the bigs in that game is going to be yeah, fascinating that's, to watch. It's, it, it, but... it actually is. Yeah. Like I said, like I'm a little more interested because of the NC State factor in that game, just because of what you just talked about there. The yeah. Edie, the Edie versus Burns inside. Yeah. And I, yeah. I mean, like I said, I watched NC State when they came to Notre Dame and I watched the Burns kid. And I mean, he won the game for NC State. He hit the last second shot to win the game yeah. against Notre Dame. And I watched him the entire game. And it's just amazing to me that that big of a dude from a width standpoint, can make it up and down the court as often as he does and play as well as he does. I mean, it's just, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, <laughs> but he's a good player. Yep. He's a good player. Decaf says he has no interest in the men's tournament. And, you know, let's, let's be honest, you know, as we've talked about on this show, there is a lot more interest. There's an all time record interest in the women's tournament this time around. I think there's a lot more interest. And we'll, I've got a question. That I'm that I'm saving up. I'm putting in the back pocket. Save it. Are you going to be here Friday? I believe I will be. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Couldn't yes. remember. Well, saving it up for Friday. What? It was a question mark. Well, give me a well. It, I want a there, yes or a no. I will be there. But there okay. was a question because we're going to go on a little, uh, like a 24 hour little trip starting tomorrow. Okay. And but I'll be back by Friday night. Excellent. So excellent. So I'm saving it up for Friday. Yes. In the back. All pocket. right. Love it. If I can remember, are we going to be? Is it going to be a triumvirate or is it just going to be you and me? I believe it's the three of us. Nice. That I know of. I don't think we've got a whole lot of. I don't think we got a lot of April conflict. I'll have to go back and double check that spreadsheet, though. Yes. Got to get to the spreadsheet. I know there's some track meets in there for me. I was going to say, uh, I don't think I've got any April. You're back, buddy. Basketball's done. You're back and you're not going anywhere. Just stuck with me every day. All right, good questions in the mailbag tonight. Appreciate it as always. We will uh, wrap it up with that. Hit that like button before you leave. And of course, play your podcast. Go to the podcast. Go to Apple. Go to Spotify, wherever it happens to be. Hit play on those buttons if if you don't catch all the show here on the old YouTube channel. Great to have you, though. And we will talk to you tomorrow on Aviation Sports Talk.